Okay, well, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, I want to welcome you guys to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yes, yeah, we're so thank excited. you. <laughs> yeah, what a special experience this is. I was really uh, pleased when you reached out uh, suggesting that we try to do something together. And um, I don't think I've ever had quite this. I don't think I've ever done a threesome, <laughs> so to speak. Real crowd scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah we really. We fun. <laughs> yeah, right. It should be. And, and um, so that's what we're doing here. And also, haven't done one where uh, this podcast is going to be on my show, Shrink Wrap Radio, and it's going to be on your show, This Jungian Life. What a great title that is, too, I must say, for uh, what you guys are doing, This Jungian Life. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Dave came up with that very creatively when we were hashing around ways of, of uh-huh. packaging this for people. Yeah, But I think that... Um, the whole group of us are really um, work synergistically. One of the things that we had noticed when we were going through training, the three of us, is that when the three of us would get together, we could just never stop talking. Uh-huh. I mean, it would go <laughs> on and on and on. And so when Lisa came forward with this great idea about what would it be like to have uh, somebody be a fly on the wall when we're just uh, jawing away about Jungian ideas, would anybody be interested in that? And uh, so we gave it a shot. Yeah, yeah. What a great idea that was. So um, where do I want to go next here? Um, so I, I guess what I'd like, since you started talking about your podcast, uh, let's uh, maybe, Lisa, you could give us uh, an overview of this Jungian life. We've heard a little bit of the history of how it happened. Yeah, well, as Joseph was saying, the three of us went through Jungian training together, and it was such a profound experience, really, to be able to share the integration of these ideas together, the three of us. And, you know, we studied for our exams, and we did cases together, and it was a real kind of, you know, a deep friendship, for one thing, but also an experience that helped us uh grow professionally as analysts. And we missed that. We missed having that opportunity to be involved in an endeavor, a joint endeavor together. And then I had actually been interviewed on a podcast a couple summers ago, and I thought, gee, this is really interesting. This is really kind of fun. I wonder what it would be like to have my own podcast. And I, uh, sort of thought about it for a little while and then mentioned it to Jeff and Joseph and both of them immediately went, yes! Yes, wow! That was really great. So the concept of the show is we take about the first half of the show and we talk about really just about anything from a Jungian perspective. So for example, oh, I don't know, we recently recorded an episode about regret, right? And so you know, we talk about regret in a general way. We might try to link it to some archetypal material, like a myth or a fairy tale. And and we just sort of circumambulate it and uh, come up with as many different ways of thinking about it as possible from a, a, a psychological perspective. And then the second half of the show, we always interpret a listener's dream. So we've got oh, these oh, wonderful oh, listeners who submit dreams and we we pick them and we we you know uh, share our thoughts about what the dream that might mean. Now, of course, we can't really interpret the dream without the dreamer there, but we can have some ideas about it and kind of show the audience it's sort of educational. You know, this is what's involved in thinking symbolically. Yes. Okay, that's a great introduction. Unfortunately, I'm hearing some feedback when I talk. And a cure for that would be if everybody has on earbuds or or earphones. Is that possible? Okay. Yeah. I th- they, they, let me. I just have to run get something, but I'll be right okay. back. Okay. Okay. And in the meantime, uh, would this be a good way time for me to add some words? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, One of the things that I think we do on the podcast, in addition to discussing a topic like loneliness or anxiety uh, and a dream, is I think we are modeling, or I hope we're modeling for our listeners, 
how we think about something as yes. much as it is what we think. Right. And that we build on each other's ideas. It's, um, we keep on jumping off of each other's ideas to amplify the topic that we're discussing. So it's a nice uh, model for a dialogue where we are continually building on what one another says. And sometimes we have different ideas, but it's an additive process of make the topic larger, make our dynamic larger. Um, it, so it's a nice, I hope it's a nice model for uh, an interactive process. Uh, that's certainly how I experienced it as a listener. And mm-hmm. it was great to, uh, that's exactly how I, uh, as I mentioned, I was talking to my wife about it a little bit and saying, uh, you know, what's really, because she was a little shocked. Well, how can they work on dreams? At first, she was kind of offended. How can they work on dreams if the person's not there to give their associations and so on? Yes. And I said, well, really, it's a chance for people to see how unions think about dreams Mm -hmm. exactly yeah and we often will have a disclaimer uh as lisa just provided a few minutes ago that of course we can't do everything at all without the dreamer present but there are symbols there are images that give us ideas about how we might be thinking in a session uh for example if a dreamer mentions a mirror what's a mirror what comes up for us around mirror Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there are universal aspects that we can uh, be curious about. Um, And people out there who are having dreams or talking about it with somebody who's not a therapist could uh, at least make a beginning uh, in much the same manner. Yeah. Well, our listeners will have a chance to experience that uh, in just a bit when, because we've got some listener submitted dreams that we're exactly. going to be paying attention to. So that's kind of a good overview of of uh, this Jungian Life podcast, which is wonderful. I noticed that you started in 2018, so it's been about a year. You've got something like 38 or 39 up there, which is great. Off to a a running start. Are you doing it once a week? How do you well, how do you decide when we how get often together? Do it? Um, we the podcasts load one at a time every week, but uh, when we get together, we sit together and we do some now at at a distance. But mm. uh, we will try to do seven or eight um, oh. episodes <laughs> over a two day period or something like that. Oh, how efficient! <laughs> That's great. The gift of being That's extroverts. And, and, and I notice, I notice that you're all uh, kind of midlife adults, and uh, so. And I was having a little conversation with Joseph uh, while we were ra- waiting for the rest of you to show up, and he let me know that he had a background in uh, Alexander work. And so, how about you, other two? What was your previous life, <laughs> Lisa? Uh, let's see. Well, I, um, I had a couple of different <laughs> careers before I, um, decided to pursue becoming a union analyst, but I, I worked in my twenties. I worked in the field of international humanitarian assistance. So I actually worked for a refugee organization in Bosnia for a couple oh, wow. of years in the nineties. And I worked in Washington on policy side and, and in New York for a little while. Um, and, and then I, I just got bitten and I, I knew I wanted to try to pursue this. So I did yeah. go back. Um, uh, I think I must have, yeah, I, I went back and got a, an MSW in my early thirties and then okay. proceeded to do union training. Yeah. So, and Deb, how about you? Well, I too have had a couple of career incarnations. I started out as a special ed teacher working with adolescents. And, uh, then I switched over to working in program development and, uh, fundraising for a hospital and a couple of uh, universities, Stanford and Carnegie Mellon. And then I ran into the classic sort of midlife, uh, wall difficulty. And um, decided that I would try everything to get out of it, including going into therapy, 
with a Jungian, Jung, I know, heaven for Fen, uh, with a Jungian. And that um, put me in touch with my own desire to become a therapist myself. And, and like Lisa, I got and I was in a Jungian seminar and a Jungian dream group, and um, and so here I am on my, I guess, third career incarnation. Great. And I would I would add that uh, Lisa and Joseph may be at midlife, but I think I've kind of moved beyond that. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, good I'm company. Still at Me too. And- <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, that's a great background to have. Let me say something about Shrink Wrap Radio uh, for for your listeners. Uh, mm-hmm. This will maybe be their first exposure to me. And uh, I, I'm actually in my 14th year of this podcast. I got started in the first year of podcasting. <laughs> That's so, amazing. So when I approached a friend or two <laughs> saying, hey, would you like to do this? thing with me? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> they didn't know what it was. They weren't mm-hmm. interested, etc. And now we've gone to the place where for a long time as in sort of promoting my podcast, you know, with people, uh, what's a podcast? Nobody knew for the longest period of time. And it's just now starting to really break wide into the culture because there's now a TV show in which the star of the show is a podcaster, a young African man, African American man, who's it's a delightful show. I think it's on CBS and it's called uh, God Friended Me. Also, oh, yes. there was a major article in the New Yorker, which is one of my most important journals that I follow. And there was an article, uh, a lot about uh, podcasting. So it's now becoming a thing for a much wider audience, which uh, we can all celebrate and hope for. Mm-hmm. So I started back in 2005, and as I say, I'm in my 14th year and have done more than 700 episodes. Wow. Uh, And as a result of that, I recently received an award at Harvard University from the president of the American Psychological Association for for having been a psychological pioneer in the world of podcasting. So as I'm sure you can understand, I'm thrilled about that. And I can't, oh, of course. I, I Congratulations. Can't resist, thank yes. you. I can't resist bragging about it every every <laughs> opportunity. Well, and, and we've, we've been a fan of your podcast, so you've been a sort of oh, mentor to us. Oh, oh, wonderful. <laughs> That's so good to hear. And so then, as you probably know, um, I kind of cover the waterfront in terms of yes. uh, a very broad conception of psychology. Mm-hmm. But there are certain themes that have I've hit on a lot. And Jungian psychology and dream work, both of those have been very big threads. And although I'm not a Jungian analyst, but certainly uh, I've fantasized that, thought about it, uh, but did not end up going down that path. Oh, it's not too late. <laughs> I don't know. I think at some point, maybe the, the institutes would look askance. Hey, this is a big investment for us. <laughs> we want this person to be around for a while. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's that's basically it for the podcast. And uh, so I think we probably should also talk a little bit about uh, – our background in terms of dreams. You've given us some hints. Maybe you want to say more. I'll I'll start off and try to model it and try to do it (laughs) without taking too much time. You know, having been a professor for a long time, that's a big challenge (laughs) Mm because we're used to holding forth. Um, So I have a longstanding interest in both uh, psychoanalytic uh, thought uh, and Jungian thought. The psychoanalytic came first because the doctoral program that I was in at the University of Michigan at that time was a very psychoanalytic program. I didn't know it. I just ended up there by fate. I uh, rebelled against it in many ways and reached out to look at a lot of other uh, mm. uh, approaches to psychology. So I've always been very kind of Catholic in my interests uh, in the sense of being broad and and uh, as universal as I could be. And then when I started at Sonoma State University, where I taught, they had a humanistic psych- psychology program, which really fit who I was much better. 
And one of the faculty there, one of my peers, was a a, a Jungian, not an analyst, but uh, very much very uh, immersed in Jungian thought. And he had been running dream groups with students, and this is back in the early seventies, nineteen seventy, seventy one, seventy two. I ended up teaching a, a class, kind of borrowing that idea from him, and um, taught a class called Myth, Dream, and Symbol for mm -hmm. maybe close to 20 years, both at Sonoma oh. State University and during, during a two-year stint at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, I've been in dream groups with, with peers and led dream groups, uh, very much influenced by uh, the International Association for the Study of Dreams, IASD, which I see some heads nodding. Montague Ullman at Maimonides Hospital years ago uh, pioneered uh, an approach called a projective group dream work in which the approach is to kind of, well, recognize that even with tons of training, there's a lot of projection involved. You know, if I'm, if I'm saying, here's what I get from your dream, it really makes sense, I think, to cushion it, cushion it with if this were my dream. So that's kind of part of that practice, which I try. And Jeremy Taylor is somebody who uh, unfortunately passed away recently. And um, yeah, so that's probably the, uh, you know, that, that's, that's how I got here <laughs> in terms of a strong interest in dreams. And anything that you guys want to add in terms of, uh, I don't know, you know, you each have unique professional backgrounds. And if this whole session were all about you guys, which normally it would be, uh, I would dig into that because I would imagine that those previous careers in some ways inform your work mm -hmm. now. Absolutely. Yeah, that you yes. draw upon it. And so I guess one, one question to ask you to each comment on is maybe um, what your unique slant is. We've got three people here, and yet you're not identical. And you all went through the same training, but you're not identical. And you probably don't pick up all the time on the exact same element. So right. why don't you each uh, speak a little bit? And Joe, you can kick things off. You've been quiet for a while. Um. Well, my uh, early background was uh, a training in theater. And then as I became uh, aware of the vicissitudes of being a professional actor, I became an Alexander Technique teacher. And as an Alexander Technique teacher, there's a lot of attention to how the body responds to stimulus, and particularly the idea of fight or flight response and how that can distort um, a, a lot of the natural corrective instincts that we have. So when I began to do mental health work, first as a psychiatric social worker and then as an analyst, I feel that I'm particularly attuned to how people's bodies are speaking in the room. And that might be something that I hold very privately, or it might be something that I comment on. But I think that the body is talking in the middle of the analysis as well. I also find that because of the imaginative work of having been an actor, but there's a way in which I like to enter into the imaginal world with my clients and in some ways co-experience what's happening both in the room and even in the dream life. So yeah. as an extrovert, that's particularly um, easy for me to do, but it's, mm -hmm. um, it's different than I think my own analyst was when I was uh, being analyzed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Deb and Lisa, I was talking to, Joseph was the first one in the room here, and immediately <laughs> I said, were you, were you an actor? Uh, because <laughs> really? his voice is so perfect uh. Uh, for this. So it was no surprise to learn that. Uh, Lisa, you want to pick up the thread and talk about uh, how your uh, early experience, work experience, informs your work now? Sure. I, I'm not so aware that my earlier work experience informs my work, but I can tell you that I think my upbringing did very much. My my mother was very interested in Jung, actually, and she would sort of sit and read the collected works when me and my sister were at school. In fact, a lot of my <laughs> copies of the collected works were her copies with her notes in the margin, which is kind of neat. And she really valued, um, she valued myth and she valued dreams and 
uh, you know, I remember talking to her about my dreams and, and she, she, you know, communicated to me the value of the inner life. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I kind of came into adulthood with that. And, uh, I will say, (laughs) yes, absolutely. I'm very grateful for it, actually. And I will say that when I, when I started, you know, contemplating my career change, um, I listened to my dreams. I was writing my dreams down and I didn't know what to do with them exactly, but I, I did know they were important. And, uh, you know, I'm, um, I think somewhat like Joe, I'm, I'm, I work from an intuitive place. I think that's just sort of my strength. So when I'm listening to a client's dream material, I'm often in a kind of intuitive reverie and, I'll sort of see what the psyche wants to bring up and sort of share that. And it's a real collaborative process, but I, I absolutely believe in the importance of dream work and bringing that sort of unknown information into the room, you know, something that the conscious mind sure. isn't aware of. Yeah. And I, I know for sure that it can, it can unstick people from stuck places and it can move the growth process along more quickly. It can kind of quicken the pace yeah. of transformation. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. I forgot to mention that I've kept a dream journal too, off and on for 30, 30 years or more. So, yeah, Deb. Well, I would say um, that my previous careers influenced me in the sense that they were all highly relational careers Mm -hmm. of connecting with people. Um, And I learned, especially as a special ed teacher, that often the learning difficulties that were supposed to be the agenda were, were really not the main focus. And that if there was a relationship and a depth of understanding, that that was really the groundwork from which um, a reading problem or um, a thinking and organization problem really needed to emerge. Um, for me, working with dreams is the introduction to the inner other that we all have. And we don't know that we have this connection to more of us and perhaps not us. Um, but dreams provide an easily accessed nightly channel or portal through which we can make a connection that makes a huge difference to us. And, and for me, um, as a feeling type, extroverted feeling kind of person, um, I tend to go for what the affect in the dream images Mm -hmm. elicits in me and in uh, the person who is in the room that I'm working with. Uh, um, And I think feeling is some of the place that we really need to get ourselves reacquainted with and reconnected with. I know for myself in therapy that one of the big surprises I had working with a Jungian, we were working with dreams, was the day when all of a sudden it really clicked of, oh, my goodness, this is my dream. Something really happened in in me in a felt way uh, that that gave me the sense of what Jung talks about, of an inner companion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Well, uh, there's so much more that we could say. I mean, as each of you speak, uh, it sparks stuff in me, you know, and I can go <laughs> off. And, <laughs> and uh, But uh, let's go ahead, and uh, does this feel like a, a good time for us to jump into uh, uh-huh. working with sure. one of the dreams that was? And were, were the listeners from my audience or your audience or a mix of the two? Well, we we don't know for sure, so I cr- oh, okay. I created a special link just for Shrink Wrap Radio, and I know you put it on your website, correct? Yes. And we also put it. Uh, I think we ran a Facebook post with it. Okay. So my guess is it it's probably mostly your listeners because I imagine that you probably have more listeners than we do. <laughs> but uh, not for long. But, <laughs> But they, um, but yeah, but it's for this episode. This was a special, 
collection of dreams just for yeah, this episode. Yeah, great. Yeah, I did announce it in a monthly newsletter that I put out, I think maybe twice and in a couple of episodes. I even mm-hmm. announced it early. I was so excited that <laughs> I said that you were going to be my guest last week. So oh, I apologize okay. to everybody. <laughs> it's this week. <laughs> okay. Okay, so... Uh, I defer to you guys. We're moving into your world here. Uh, You choose a dream, and uh, somebody will read it, and then we'll see what happens. I'd like to invite the uh, listeners to really um, enter into this in the way that we do as analysts. So even though people have submitted the dreams and we've read them, we often like to read them slowly in the space and to track the kinds of images or feelings that the dream evokes, even though we don't personally know the dreamer. And that begins to become the thread of dialogue as we exemplify ways of dealing with symbols. I even have a pen and a pad here just in case I, something comes up and I know Mm -hmm. I might forget it. Yeah. Is it, are you going to read the dream? Yeah. Sure. Uh, Okay. So this first dream is, um, a uh, 45 year old woman who is an artist and a journalist. And here's the dream. I am in session with my female psychologist. I am telling her something and she does not know the answer or is unsure of it. So she gets out her black cell phone and makes a call to a mentor or superior, I assume. The next thing, we are standing on a spiral stairs. My psychologist is one or two steps higher than me. We are both around the middle. On top of the stairs, there is a black woman, probably in her 60s, very smartly dressed in black. She seems serious, but not stern, like someone with natural authority gravitas. She has a black cell phone, and I gather that she is the person my therapist called. She says, the answer is a blue bird or a blue jay. Then I look down my hands and see I am holding a blue bird in them. And uh, let's see. So just we ask for a little bit of context. And this is what the dreamer said. She says, I'm not in therapy, so I have no therapist. My older children, 18 and 20, have left home. And we have had a few losses in our lives. I am married and feel like my life has been in transition for the past five years. And we, we always ask the dreamer what the main feelings were in the dream. And she says, it wasn't emotionally charged, mostly surprise to see the bird in my hands. And uh, she, she mentions also, again, that she's not in therapy now. She's never had a Jungian therapy but she is a fan of Marion Woodman's. So when we're listening to a dream, there are often two stances we can take. One would be an objective stance where the dreamer or the dream maker is commenting on actual figures in the person's life, or we can take a purely subjective stance where everything in the dream is symbolic of an internal psychological process, often on multiple levels. Since we know that the dreamer does not have a psychologist and is not in therapy, it leads me to want to approach the dream as a purely internal and subjective process. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good place to start. And the beginning of the dream is often uh, the situation, the internal situation or life situation as it is. And so the situation is I'm in session with my female psychologist and telling her something she doesn't know the answer to. Now, I want to comment on something that Deb said, which is important, is which is quite different from, let's say, how Freudian dream analysis is done. Jung believed that dreams are not deceptive and they're not shrouding, that the dream maker is actually describing things exactly the way it needs to be described and is not withholding anything. So in the situation of being in a session with a psychologist, we can imagine that the dream environment is something that um, 
is a rarefied environment that when people come to their psychologist, there is a prescribed expectation that the psychological life is going to be examined and is going to be put at the forefront. So I'm, I'm struck by a, f- a few things in this stream. One is uh, the feminine seems to be something that runs right through the whole heart of the dream. And another is something about hierarchy. Mm-hmm. Somebody's up, mm-hmm. somebody's there in the middle. Yeah. They're on a spiral below. staircase and there's a yes. gradations. Yeah. 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 So I'll just throw those two things in there. Yeah, I mean, I think your your point about the feminine. I mean, the the dreamer's female, the psychologist is female, the supervisor's female. So we're, you know, if this were a fairy tale, it's like, well, look, everything, you know, you know, everything's on the feminine side here. So we note that, you know, that the the there isn't a, a lot of masculine energy. Yes. Yeah, and to add to the hierarchical uh, symbolism. Uh, when the therapist makes a call, it's to us a mentor or superior, she assumes. And in session, you know, we are going to someone who has, we hope and believe, more knowledge than we do. Um, and the, the image of the spiral staircase is uh, very, very evocative and, and mythological yeah. of stairs and circulation and up and down, uh, something like Jacob's Ladder. Mm. Uh, ascending and descending. I, I've and often referred spiral. to the spiral in, in talking about the therapeutic process that sometimes people will feel like, oh, I've worked on this issue already. You know, why do I have to deal with this issue <laughs> again? And it seems to be the nature of our life path in many ways is a spiral. And yes. we come we come around to that place again, to that issue that we thought we had resolved or uh, that keeps haunting us, but we're at a different level with it, hopefully at a higher level. That's a yes. great amplification because yeah. I use that image all the time with really? people. I'll say, yeah, it's the same issue, but you're on a different, you know, you're higher up the yeah. spiral. So yeah, there, yeah. that is a and quite an image. And that's reflected in the succession of therapists, that there's a return to the idea of a therapeutic attitude in the psyche, but the first attitude is not adequately penetrating. And so there has to be another circle around to a deeper or more profound kind of attitude, and particularly that has a greater amount of authority. Mm -hmm. So there's a way in which we come across this all the time when we're talking to friends, that um, you might have three friends in a room and they're all giving advice. They might all be giving the same advice, but one friend just carries enough authority for the listener to believe them and actually have it make an impact on them. Yeah. So it's finding the voice inside of the psyche that the dreamer can actually be affected by versus dismissive of. Mm-hmm. And there is that, that sense of the, the dream ego, uh, the dreamer as she experiences herself in the dream, and then one up her therapist, psychologist, and then one up above that, um, this black woman standing on the spiral staircase, um, in the highest position. I'm curious too about how many times the word black has yes. occurred in this dream. Yes. Yeah, there's the black cell phone. The woman is black. She's dressed in black. So yes. smartly uh, dressed. Mm-hmm. Dave, did you have thoughts about that? Well, that was definitely one of the things that I noticed. And um, I guess when I think of black, I think of the darks. You know, the, of the underworld, I guess, of mm-hmm. the, of the, what's, of the unconscious, of what's not mm-hmm. known. And so, in a sense, you know, if, if this were my dream, it might be depicting, uh, an, an interest in the psychological attitude that, that Joseph was yeah. talking and psychological exploration and a sense of, uh, maybe working my way up. And so I'm interested in this, in the verticality that's in this stream. Mm-hmm. And actually the, the, the final image is like a punch in a way. It's like yes. a koan with this nice punch at the end, this bluebird. And, and I think of the bluebird of happiness, you know, was the first mm-hmm. thing that popped into my mind. 
But then I'm thinking of the bird as, again, verticality, birds fly, uh, the bird and Jungian thought can symbolize the transcendent function Mm. and spirituality. And I'm struck by, it's in her own hands. She's she's looking to outside, I am looking to outside authority. Mm -hmm. I'm looking to somebody who knows who's older than I am and more uh, studied more, who can give me the answer. But ultimately, at the end of the dream, the answer is in my own hands. Okay. Yes, but the but the event in the dream is she apparently cannot see what's in her hand until another person names it, which tells us mm-hmm. that there's a poverty of early mirroring in the psyche. Hmm. Because in the way that children have all kinds of potential, but if the parents don't verbalize it, don't mirror back to them what is observed, yeah. the child can not not know it about themselves. Yeah. So is part of this kind of transitional place that she might be in, and we're all speculating, of course, that yeah. there's something about the the higher woman, the greater therapist, being able to speak a truth that then allows her to see what has been there. And I think as therapists, that's such an, an important part of what we do. Yeah. I'm thinking about um, the image of looking down of the rest of the, the previous part of the dream in a way has been a looking up to her own therapist, to the black woman on the stairs, etc. And the the lysis or ending of the dream is I look down at my hands mm-hmm. Um and I would think too that these images of blackness, the cell phone, the dress, et cetera, um, are images of the attitude towards shadow. What you were saying, uh, David, about, um, the black as a standout feature and what's dark as shadow is our, the unknown part of us and we're often reluctant to engage it. Um, but that's often where the treasure is and that all this repeated imagery of black finally leads to a blue bird. Yeah. I'm going to just throw in something a little different. First of all, just remind us Good. that the therapist would be an inner therapist. So it might yes. be an inner attitude of, of, of seeking healing perhaps. So, and, and that would sort of track with what the dreamer said that she's kind of been in a process of transformation. So she has access to some kind of inner healing authority, you know, of both the lower authority and the higher authority of the supervisor. And I'm, I mean, I'm interested in the black too. And of course, I'm also thinking, you know, Jung was very interested in alchemy and one of the alchemical stages is the negredo where there's sort of, uh, you know, decay and it's kind of, uh, a, almost sort of a death image and that's associated with blackness. But I don't want to um, lose sight of the fact that the, there's a black cell phone and the woman is dressed smartly in black. And so it almost feels a little bit more like um, it, 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 it's not quite fitting for me to say that it, it maybe is shadow or negredo entirely because it sounds more like some of our conscious associations with black is it's sophisticated, you know. Mm-hmm. It's Everybody horrible. in New York wears black, right? That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. And but, it's but a positive it, relationship with shadow is what I yeah. am okay. feeling about it. Mm-hmm. it but also um, black alchemically is associated with Saturn. And that would align with the feeling of authority and gravitas. Yeah, that's, oh, yes, that's that great. The woman is a that's very good. Saturnine figure. I also, I also have a personal feeling and a theory that As the ego brushes against the sequence of symbols in a dream, there is this kind of libidinal transfer Uh of the symbol into the ego state. So there's something about the Saturnine structuring gravitas of the woman is passed into the dreamer, which then allows something to constellate. And as Deb, you were saying, there's Mm -hmm. something about the authority of carrying the bird in her hand that some of that gravitas of having the bird in the hand versus two in the bush of, uh, <laughs> uh, of constellating and making the invisible visible, which I think is very much associated with Saturn. Well, one thing about the bird, the ending of the stream is it's a surprise. Yeah. It's a very big mm-hmm. surprise. And it is like, we might imagine that this dreamer is sort of looking for something, right? She's there 
in her therapist's office and and the therapist is looking for something she doesn't have the answer she has to go somewhere else and look for it and then you know there it is and joseph as you said it's like the or maybe deb you said it someone said the answer was sort of in her hands yes. you know and it's color it's it's life and it's color yes so out of this sort of black spiral environment Suddenly, it's in my hand. It's and it's colorful. It's to me, and it is alive. It's not a dead bird, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and it suggests to me the possibility of a spiritual direction. So that if I think of this as my dream, I might see it as calling me to to uh, raise my vision to mm. to maybe uh, seek the spiritual think- side of things. <laughs> What comes from up for me is the beautiful image of the bird, and I agree with everything you've said, Dave, uh, but the bird in her hands, um, and Joseph, your phrase of a bird in the hand and not two in the bush, that it's uh, uh, the conjunctio of something that is spiritual. Uh, birds are often associated with spirituality. Um, and something very concrete and down to earth, which is our hands, our agency, uh, something we can get a grip on, something, um, we can get a hold of. And that those two things have connected in this final dream image. It's really lovely. Mm-hmm. Now, I'd like to also add a, a, a flip, a different, um, edge to the, the lysis of the dream, because this is, this is a woman whose children are 18 and 20 years old. So she's got a bit of an empty nest. Mm-hmm. And we know that the dream maker is, is always nudging the psyche forward teleologically to the next step or what's the next blossoming opportunity for the soul. So if we apply what's called a naturalistic lens to the dream, if you literally were to look down and you had a bird in your hand, mm-hmm and it was a live bird, the next likely thing you would eventually do is you would have to let it go and watch it fly away. Mm -hmm. So Mm. if we take that feeling and then we look at her association that she's in a big transition, she's lost her role as, you know, the mother hen with her babies (laughs) and she's holding on to this bird and that suddenly that's been made visible to her. There is a moment of choice and the dream isn't telling her what to do, but there is an implication that sometimes you're going to have to let go of that bird. You know, I'd I'd forgotten about the context that she gave us where she said, uh, my older children, 18 and 20, have left home Mm -hmm. and we have had a few losses in our lives. Mm -hmm. I am married and I feel my life has been in transition for the past five years. That certainly underscores what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Now, also, I'm interested that, although she hasn't been in therapy, she's been reading Marion Woodman. Now, Marion Woodman is a Jungian analyst. Everybody may not be aware of that. A very powerful, uh, well-known. Uh, and maybe, maybe we would do well to think about what Marion Woodman writes about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you have a particular idea around this dream? Um, Marianne Woodman, uh, the work of hers that I'm familiar with, is very, very much about um, feminine psychology. Mm-hmm. And the book that this dreamer references is The Pregnant Virgin. Uh, and there are a number of books that uh, Marianne Woodman has authored, um, particularly focused on women's growth and development. Uh-huh. So the pregnant virgin b- brings me back to the bluebird and the opening up of mm-hmm. this life taking flight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, and that's a, a such a good point because, um, sure, if you have a bird in your hands, it's going to fly, but that is taking wing and taking life. We say taking wing as a metaphor for for your own path and trajectory mm-hmm. is what lies ahead. Yeah, this there, dream really just feels like a gift, you know? Yes. It, yes. it feels, feels like a gift. It, there's yes. this, something's been given to this dreamer. 
Yeah, you know, Jung talks about big dreams, and uh, we could maybe get into that a little bit. And I've had a few in my life that, to mm-hmm. me, just had that ineffable oh, feeling, like they didn't really want to be analyzed. It was like a gift, <laughs> you know, just like this marvelous gift. And if this were my dream, I think I might very well experience it as a, as a big dream with that wonderful gift at the end of this colorful mm-hmm. blue bird and and yeah. all the potential that that suggests. Yeah. I go back to the feeling, and I have the same feeling that you do, Dave, of, of what a lovely dream, and it's a gift. And I'm thinking about the dreamer saying that she didn't feel particularly emotionally charged, but surprised. And I'm, I'm hoping if she listens, as I believe she will, to this podcast, that um, this this may deepen her appreciation for what a, what a lovely dream image she has been granted. Yeah. You know, that might be a good wrap-up line uh, so that we would have time to move on to another dream. Does another that feel one. right, or am I Let's closing go. us off prematurely? Okay. okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Who wants to read the next one? I will read it. Um, this is the dream of a 54-year-old woman who says she has very varied kinds of work. Here's the dream. I was hiking in the mountain up and down a valley and kept running into bears. I made it back to my cabin, and the bears were in my yard and in my house. They were in my daughter's room, and she was small. I approached to see what might have happened, for the bear seemed to be sitting with her in a play area. And then I awoke. And what she provides for us in the way of context is that the bears were protective mothers, or they consumed her. The dream repeated itself. My daughter is a grown woman. I think I was reviewing my situation as a single mom and how dependent I was on my mother, with whom I have a bad relationship because she's overbearing. Also, my daughter's other caretakers in daycare and lack of family support and shame and difficulty. A warning or awareness of what women can be in one's life. You know, I just noticed something as you read that, uh, that I hadn't noticed before. Maybe this is the Freudian in me, but she's talking about <laughs> bears, and then she uses the word overbearing. Overbearing, yeah. Oh, beautiful. Isn't that great? Beautiful. Um, I just, I just want to lift up that she says that the feelings in the dream were terror, exhaustion, trying, strife, and unstableness, mm-hmm. which actually was interesting to me because just as an image, lots of bears could evoke lots of different, um, feelings, right? So it's important that this dreamer experience, this dream is sort of, um, Terrifying and just right, distressing. Did anybody else? I'm wondering how you all responded to the phrase the bears were protective mothers or they consumed her. Mm -hmm. Do you take consumed her means to mean that the bears ate? the children? You know, it is a little confusing. I think what, what I imagined when I read that was that um, this was this is a dream that has repeated itself and that sometimes the bears seem protective and at other times it seems like maybe they ate the daughter. Mm-hmm. Does that track with what other people understood? Well, I think that they really, she's capturing the paradox of symbols that yeah. um, there's a positive kind of right. warming spiritual idea around the bear and uh, bear medicine and shamanism. But then there's also a very, you know, uh, intense it, aspect yeah. of nature. Nature is red in tooth and claw. Mm-hmm. And, uh, kill or be killed. So yeah. it's all, I like that she has both of the qualities in her associations to bears. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And did anybody else think about Goldilocks? Yes. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> uh, because the, the bear is there with the little girl, uh, sitting in a play area. And I, of course, thought of Goldilocks. 
The play area, yeah. I thought the play area, that struck me, the play area. I felt like mm -hmm. there's stuff to mine there, but I didn't go to Goldie, Goldilocks. Mm -hmm. So the first, thing tagged that, it. I, the first thing that I go to with the dream is um, the ambivalence we have around wild animals and how close or how distant we are in terms of um, creating the right relationship to them. So the fact that she's perhaps had numerous dreams about bears and that the unconscious is this, in this multiplicatio, this mm -hmm. bears, bears and bears everywhere, right. that there's this relentless demand in the psyche that she come into a relationship with whatever bears represent in her psyche mm -hmm. and that fleeing from it is just not going to be tolerated by the psyche. Yeah, well, one of the things that I noted was that the bear is a powerful, potentially a powerful ally, uh, mm -hmm. but also dangerous. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, I, I wrote smother mother. That was the first association. Mm -hmm. uh, ambivalent relationship is symbolized in the bear. And bears are a very powerful mother image. We're always mm -hmm. talking about mama bear. Yeah. And you don't mess with you don't mess with Mama Bear's cubs because you know that uh, Mama Bear will be right after you. Yeah, that's I mean that's when bears are most dangerous, right? Is when they have cubs. That's when exactly. you say don't come between a uh, bear and her cub. And she is wrestling with her ambivalent feelings, I imagine, um, about her own mother and the support she needed when she was a single mother. And yet, as you pointed out, Dave, um, her mother is overbearing. Uh, so there's this ambivalence, perhaps, around uh, her mother image or her mother complex. We might say, mm -hmm. and we, we all and we all have a mother complex. Yeah, and we might even imagine that the bear is sort of standing in for, an, you know, is an image of this woman's mother complex, which won't leave her alone. I mean, she's hiking up and down. She keeps running into bears. She makes it back to her cabin. There are more bears there. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like she can't, you know, and, and in a way that tracks with her biographical information that it sounds like maybe she would have wanted to separate more from her mother as an adult, but couldn't because she needed her mother's help in raising her own child. And this, and the bear as a stand-in for the mother is really problematic. Mm -hmm. because bears are not good choices as human mothers. No. So it comes into the idea of the archetypal compensation when there is a tremendous lack in the child. And this is an idea that Don Kalshad unpacks beautifully in his book, The Inner World of Trauma. Mm -hmm. That as a young child, if we have a tremendous deficit in the psychic growth, that the individual's soul uh, in one way or another will call from the collective unconscious an archetypal patchwork to add into the psyche so that the child can continue to thrive in one fashion or another. But then as we become adults and the inner resources blossom, become more dynamic, that same patchwork of archetypal images becomes a problem. So if her way of moving through the world or even raising her own children is constantly mixed with bear mother, she may be dreaming about it because she's at the point in her life where she can begin to confront that and perhaps separate from it. Mm -hmm. But there are other ways of being a mother that are perhaps more refined and less instinctive. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of riff on that for a second, you know, one of the things that strike me about bears is that they, they, they are oddly anthropomorphic. And, you know, there's a lot of fairy tales about, um, people who turn into bears or bears who turn into people when they stand on high leg, hind, their hind legs, they, they kind of look like people, but you know, they're not actually super well related to humans. I mean, if you see a bear in the forest, <laughs> if you see a grizzly in the forest, you might think, Oh, it's so cute, <laughs> but that it is not thinking, <coughs> Oh, there's a nice human. Let's get become friends. They're, they're, they're seeing you as, you know, potential dinner. You know, so I think, jo Joseph, you know, this idea of this being an image of something that's that's archetypal, that's been kind of unmediated and therefore not humanized, that's just largely really instinctual, that uh, that it hasn't been um, sort of uh, 
the voltage hasn't been sort of stepped down to a useful uh, kind of uh, energy. That's the feeling yes. you get from it's, this yeah. infestation of bears almost. And I'm thinking, too, of reminding uh, our listeners that these are inner images from a, from her own internal world of being a mother in the dream and a daughter. So she's the mother going into her da- inner daughter's room who is small, although in real life her daughter is grown. Yeah. Uh, so there's um, a lot going on here about being mothered and what that was like. Uh, and in this dream, it's benign because they're sitting in a play area. But as you point out, playing with a bear is not um, an altogether safe situation. And then there's uh, the dreamer as as the mother going into her daughter's room. So it seems there is a lot going on here about um, mother, daughter, and bear. Yeah, that's a that's a good amplification, Deb, because because we might imagine that this dream is speaking about her own kind of inner young one. Yes. Who needs mothering and has yes. been kind of left to the bears. Yes. Oh. Right. We often you know have this idea of, you know, being raised by wolves, you know, Romulus and Remus, or some child being raised by a wild animal. And we tend to romanticize that. But many of us are burdened with very primitive parents that have very poor skills at either making it through life or knowing how to raise a child. So I think there are generations of people that feel as if they've been raised by wild creatures. And admitting that to oneself is, I think, uh, tremendously painful. Mm -hmm. So what the dream often does... Um, which I so appreciate is that dreams will speak the unspeakable Hmm. to be able to sit with a client and say, you know, I have a feeling you're raising your children as if you're a bear. You know, what do you think of that? What is Hmm. that like for you? And what is that like for your children? And to be able to tolerate the way in which the unconscious might be confronting us with, with important information. Yeah, a part of the dreamer that was left to play with bears, uh, which I find of uh, my own reaction here is that it's is very, very poignant. Mm-hmm. And, Sad. and that this dreamer's inner daughter, um, has something to say. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, Dave, you, you mentioned the importance of it being in a play area. And I think, you know, to follow up on Deb's comment, I mean, it is really poignant, right? Because of play area, I mean, we can sort of think of Winnicott, that play is this important liminal space. Mm. And where there's, where there's, you know, you, so you have to feel a degree of safety in order to play. And that important psychological things can happen in that, in that space. Um, because, you know, in that feeling of safety, you have access to the imaginal and that sort of thing. But there's a bear in that space. Yeah. I, uh, one of the things that, uh, that I thought about was the possibility of uh, generational trauma. It sounds yes. like the dreamer is caught, yeah. caught in the middle and yeah. there's a generational thing going on here. Yes. And I don't remember why I put this. Uh, I wrote down the word shame and now I don't mm. even remember what I was picking up on. But, but I think oh um, she says she says in much shame and difficulty that's why and somehow somehow she said um, the, as part of the context also other caretakers daycare and lack of family support and much shame and difficulty somehow uh-huh. the word shame grabbed me somewhere but to be put in touch with the parts of ourselves that are primitive and perhaps even visible to other people before mm-hmm. they're visible to ourselves is is shameful, mm-hmm. or at least at the very least humbling. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like she, that this is trying to break into her consciousness. Mm-hmm. So the ego probably is feeling rattled. Mm-hmm. 
Well, one way or another, the bears are here. She cannot escape them, whether she's hiking or going back to the cabin or into her daughter's room. Uh, something from Psyche is ready to emerge into a new kind of consciousness. And I, I always think that that is essentially good news of look what what's here that she's um, being called to and is therefore I would assume ready to uh, dialogue with and integrate work with and I mean bears boy that is that is an image of a of a big amount of psychic energy right yeah. Yeah. yes so there's, there's something here that's really alive and kicking <laughs> Yeah, Dan, I like your idea of her dialoguing with the bear because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I remarked that the bear would be potentially a powerful ally. And so there are ways in which that bareness potentially is part of her, can work for her, mm-hmm. and, Absolutely. Even, even as it, maybe it's worked against her. So I think in the process of some kind of dialogic process, she could be in contact with those two sides. Yes. And begin to own them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if that energy were um, sort of could be in touch with ego, if ego could be in touch with that energy in a sort of constructive way, that would feel really different than being so, you know, tired and terrified and weary. Exactly. And, and uh, having the feeling of a lack of family support and shame and difficulty. And this is a time when sometimes we suggest uh, that the person can uh, engage in some kind of active imagination with a big dream image of think about bears, uh, journal about bears, read about bears, um, but keep that somehow in the forefront of awareness during waking life of um, paying attention to the image and letting it wander around maybe drawing bears or buying a little bear totem of some kind. Mm -hmm. But uh, to stay in touch with that image as a way of continuing uh, the dialogue and a connection with with Psyche. That's a great suggestion and uh, I think gives the maybe the dreamer out there something, a place to go with this and to work with it. I wonder Mm -hmm. if we could squeeze in one more dream here. Sure. Okay, Joseph, this one's yours <laughs> to All read. Right. So we have a 51-year-old dreamer uh, who is a translator and a private English teacher and has this dream. I'm running through dark, unknown, desert-like terrain, falling down and getting up and running again, feeling danger behind. I'm short of breath, and I have to run up the steep hill, but I slip to the bottom every time without reaching the top, though I have the feeling that if I do reach the top, I'll Mm -hmm. find an important answer. A bit of context from the dreamer is that they're suffering some health issues which are not terminal, but the dreamer's father has been diagnosed with lung cancer. And in the dream, the dream ego experiences anxiety, fear, exhaustion, and insecurity. Mm. Well, what came right up for me immediately was the myth of Sisyphus. Yes, mm. me too. I wrote it down um, there. You know, Sisyphus in Greek myth was forever pushing a big boulder up a mountain, and just as he neared the top, it would roll back down to the bottom of the mountain. And Camus wrote about that myth, and uh, and it was part of the existential philosophy of the absurd, hmm. the absurdity of, of life, the sense of the absurd, and uh, like a hamster on a treadmill. So I'm, if this were my dream, I might ask myself, where am I feeling like a hamster on a treadmill? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Patterns in life. Although what I lean into Camus' idea in his writing 
and I think the conclusion that many of the existentialists try to push us towards is that even though the outer life may be iterative and that we may feel that we're traversing the same terrain, that we are still responsible for making our lives mm-hmm. meaningful mm-hmm. even in the right. midst of modern repetition. Yeah. And we cannot rely on our job, which we perhaps have to repeat over and over again for 20 years until we retire, or our spouses who we come home to year after year, day after day, to provide meaning mm-hmm. for our lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that, adding that additional part about the responsibility mm-hmm. to, uh, to do something. I am paying attention, as I often do, to the very beginning of the dream because it, it usually gives an image of the situation, the inner psychic situation as it is. Mm-hmm. I am running through dark, unknown, desert-like terrain. So deserts are not usually particularly fruitful. It's dark. It's unknown. And the dreamer keeps repeating that he's running, falling down and getting up, running again. Uh, so I have this image of where is that happening in his life and what is it about running uh, the, the versus dreamer's walking? The female, by the way, just to, to remind you, the, the dreamer is female. Yeah, the dreamer is female. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so there's, you there's think your running. point still holds, yeah. And I'm short of breath. Mm-hmm. And the dream doesn't give us give us a context for why she's running. Mm-hmm. Is she running from, running towards, or like a lot of perhaps unfocused anxiety disorders, there's a running because there's just too much energy in the psyche, and there's that kind of panicked reaction. Exactly. Well, you know, it's interesting in this dream, um, which it has, a, it reminds me in some sense of the first dream we started with today is there is a sense that there is an answer to find mm-hmm. there, there, you know, there is, there's this, if I and, get to the top, I'll find an important answer. And again, the answer is up, which, uh, yeah. again, gives me mm-hmm. a sense of that, you know, if this were my dream, maybe I need to seek a spiritual answer. Yes, mm-hmm. um, because that's often a, a space where uh, spiritual answers are found is up. Moses went up to the mountaintop and uh, ziggurats and pyramids go up. Uh, yes. So I'm just building on your point, Dave, of that there is something up there at the top that could be very important. Mm -hmm. It could could be, but I'd like to bring in the uh, Pat Berry's um, uh, admonition. And Pat Berry is a well-known analyst that she'll, she'll often teach that the ego's attitudes in the dream are the least reliable information in the dream. And the reason is, the dream maker wants us to confront something we don't know. Mm-hmm. So often what the ego concludes in the dream environment is often known material. And I would even say that the whole dream in some ways is driven by the fantasy that there is something somewhere else that if only I could attain it, mm-hmm. everything would be better. Mm-hmm. What could also be suggested in the dream is maybe stopping running is the answer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's nothing at the top of the hill Mm -hmm. and that that's become a kind of iterative target Mm -hmm. and and a chronic attitude that does not work and that the dream maker is frustrating by constantly letting them play it out. Right. And maybe just sitting down in the mud Mm -hmm. could be an interesting experience for the person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it is a real image of psychic stuckness, isn't it? You know, and I think a lot of people come into our offices and sort of feel this way, that they they're in search of something and they keep on sort of running up the hill and then sliding right back down, you know. And the father has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Mm -hmm. I mean, there would be a lot of anxious energy wanting to perhaps transcend or or, or, anxiety or or pain of that. Because and 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 sort of stay in an anxious running place rather than perhaps dropping into grief. 
Yes, which is mm. muddy and and cold and probably. I don't know where you're getting the mud from because it does say it's a desert. But <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. When I, when I think about them, I, this is in my fantasy. When I think about them slipping to the bottom, yeah. when I think of my own history of slipping down places. I always think uh-huh. of them slick and muddy. <laughs> you're well, absolutely right. It may not be muddy at all. But, but it's very interesting that you've said that twice because yeah. how do we get mud? Well, through moisture or rain. And that that would be the salutio of perhaps uh, a grief and and something more moistening uh, coming into the psyche mm-hmm. rather than all this dry desert like terrain uh, that and moisture and rain is often um, equated with feeling mm-hmm. more, fe- more feeling instead of the fear because she feels danger behind her. So I like the image of what happens if she stops running mm-hmm. and turns yeah, I mean, around and looks at what she thinks is pursuing her. It's it's a real. Does she say that she's being pursued? We don't. She know. says she says feeling danger behind. Mm. So I as, assumed maybe incorrectly that that's oh, yeah yeah yeah, like okay, yeah pursuing her. Yep. And this yeah. idea of transcending into abstractions mm-hmm. as a way of trying to move above our anxieties, which is a reasonable coping skill, by the way, taking a very mm-hmm. broad philosophic attitude mm-hmm. or relating it to mythology can allow us to exhale a little bit and mm-hmm. to breathe easy for a moment so I can understand the temporary need to transcend. But there's something down at the bottom or behind her that she needs to grapple. That she's running, that she's running from. And there is this image. It is an image of sort of psychic lack in a way because it's a desert and she can't catch her breath. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. And, and if we think about that, all of us have been at least in high school track, you know, when you're running and you start getting out of breath, that the amount of exertion that you're applying and the body's ability to actually respond to that constructively is out of balance. Mm -hmm. You know, there's too much panic. There's too much adrenaline. There's too much fleeing. Mm -hmm. And the system is telling her we can't keep up with you. Mm -hmm. So if this was a client that came into the office, we might imagine that she needs a lot of containment. She needs a lot of support. She needs a holding environment psychologically where she could feel safe enough to actually experience herself and to believe that that experience is not going to annihilate her. So many people are afraid that the depth of their feeling will be toxic to them. How many times do we Mm -hmm. hear somebody say that if uh, I don't want to start crying because I'll just never stop, Mm -hmm. which is such a fiction, of course, but it tells us about how people fear uh, their feelings. Yeah, there's a, a desire to avoid feeling. Mm-hmm. That's greatly rewarded in our culture. Mm-hmm. Also, you know, it leads us into this whole kind of patriarchal context that, you know, being highly emotional or allowing our feelings to be very present to ourselves or to other people is somehow diminishing. And that's unfortunate. Yeah. I'm also looking at the context, uh, you know, my personal health issues, not terminal. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting conjunction there. Yeah, you know, so, that is, yeah. Uh, so there's something that's very worrisome for her. And maybe, maybe because it's not terminal, she's not really justified, you know, as you're saying, Joseph, that she's not justified to feel as concerned as she feels. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one way or the other, I think illnesses, personal health issues, and her father's diagnosis of lung cancer does bring the issue of mortality uh, into the psyche. Um, what what if mm-hmm. uh, is there? Uh, uh, and when we say, you know, it's like uh, not terminal also implies that terminal is in the room or you know yes, in right. here. its yeah. opposite has been constellated yes. as well yes 
and even being sick, particularly as we're aging, being sick is very humbling. And to be laid up in bed and to mm-hmm. not be able to have our ego rally the machine you know, mm-hmm. forward in life, it, it gives us a glimpse, you know, of end of life. It forces yeah. us to to confront our limits. And one of the limits in the dream could be that she won't reach the top of the mountain or whatever that fantasy is at the top mm-hmm. of the mountain. And, and how does, how do we orient to our limits? And there's a lot, there's a lot there. That, yes. That, that this person could be talking out either with a dear friend and or perhaps a therapist. Yeah. All three of these dreams were very rich. Yes. And, mm-hmm. uh, I want to, uh, I'm sure all, all of us here want to, uh, thank and applaud, uh, the dreamers who submitted their dreams and trusted us uh-huh. uh, to, uh, to care for them. So mm-hmm. we, we exactly. really appreciate that. Yeah. 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 I think that's been very present with us that, um, we feel connected, I think, uh, Lisa and Joseph and I, and today with you too, Dave, of what a powerful connection there is to people we don't know, mm-hmm. but through their dreams and what comes through. Mm-hmm. And uh, that that keeps us so enlivened and challenged and humbled by what people can bring to us and offer us of their psyches, even if we don't ever see them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the generosity that of people mm-hmm. to share their psyches mm-hmm. so freely. It's yeah. so kind of the listeners <laughs> to, to <laughs> We're well, moved every time. Oh, that's wonderful. You, you three embody, uh, but, you know, I think what's important and best about psychotherapy and what's so inviting about the Jungian approach is that it's so uh, steeped in the human condition, mm-hmm. <laughs> the, mm-hmm. you know, a, a recognition of the mystery and the dilemma <laughs> that we yeah. all confront and share. Mm-hmm. Yes, and how we are all connected somehow. Yeah, yeah. And can connect. Well, that's a good closing line for us here, Deb. Okay. <laughs> so, I think that's a good wrap up, at least. Uh, yeah, it's a good well, wrap up. Thank so, you so much. Thank really you for thank, ha- you, thank, thank you for inviting us. Thank you. It's been wonderful, and uh, and thanks for the trust that we mutually shared in entering into this uh, place where we didn't know what was going to come up or where we uh-huh. would go. And uh, so that's kind of a bonding experience for us, yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So carry on. I wish you great success with your podcast. Thank you. I think it, it fills uh, an important niche out there in the world of conversations between human beings. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. Farewell, Dave.